we're live. Okay, great. Um, let me ask you, is it that you believe that psychic experience are basically, you know, a, a stimulation that occurs in the um, in certain lobes of the brain? Or is there genuine psychic experience? I think both are true. I believe that there is genuine psychic experience, but that it's facilitated or dependent upon activity in certain parts of the brain. Is that a, a view shared by Dr. Persinger, too? Yes. Okay. At least there is a book, Rational Mysticism, and uh -huh. the author of the book went to Dr. Persinger's lab and had an interview with him, and Dr. Persinger mentioned to him that he did accept that psychic experiences were valid. Dr. Persinger has done a number of experiments involving psychic perception, primarily remote viewing, and yes. found that yes. uh, many of the psychic that he worked with, and there have been a couple of them, their predictions, their, uh, their perceptions were validated. I gathered that he worked with Ingo Swan and was able to yes. uh, interrupt his ability with certain um, magnetic, applying certain magnetic fields. Enhance it with some and in inhibit it with others. I understand that some people have a heavenly experience in the chair in his basement lab and some people have a hellish experience. Actually, the way Dr. Persinger's uh, uh, sessions in the chair, in the acoustic chamber, uh, the way they're structured is such that a large number of people do have an unpleasant experience uh, while they're getting the procedure, but it's intrinsic to the session design. What happens is that a signal that's derived from a function generator chirp sequence, I know that sounds pretty technical, but it's a mm -hmm. pretty, uh, pretty uh, precise signal that's used, and it isn't derived directly from brain function. That's applied to the right side of the brain first, and that's the side that has the amygdala that's specialized for the experience of fear. And that goes mm -hmm. on for about 30 minutes. Now, during that 30 minutes, the person's experience of fear can increase and, uh, until the point where they can become quite terrified. Then, really? abruptly, the signal is changed to one that's derived from the amygdala. Now, we're talking a signal that's specific to the amygdala over both sides mm -hmm. of the brain. In the first part, the amygdala on the left, the one that's specialized for emotions like joy and elation, bliss and things like that, that gets quieter and quieter. And during the second phase, it's reactivated quite suddenly, quite forcefully, quite abruptly. And what can happen, and often does happen, is a tremendous sense of bliss and well-being can occur. This is part of the experiment. It's to have this abrupt change. Is that right? Yes. It's to uh, come up with a neurological model that explains how these processes work. One right. of the things that happens yeah. in the second phase of the sessions is that because of the suddenness and the, uh, the dramatic way that the amygdala on the left is activated, act yes. activity kind of avalanches or cascades or slingshots into the left amygdala, which the first part tends to quieten. And that activity can burst out of the amygdala and interrelated structures. And that's where the specific content of many of the religious and mystic visions that Dr. Persinger gets uh, comes from. The way the amygdala connects to other structures is different for each person, making the experience different for each person. But what the fundamental functions of the amygdala on the left side are, are the same for all people, so that the theme will be uh, the form of the experience will be the same for everyone, but the specific content will vary from individual to individual. Right. Okay. Now, tell me a bit about some of the content. There have been some, a lot of really unusual visions that have happened in the chair, from what I gather. Right. Well, as mm -hmm. it happens, I am more able to talk about the experiences that come with uh, Shakti, version of this technology that I work with. I well, can I just ask about um, some of the information that people have got when they... I do um, have some stuff right in front of me that I can read to you. First hand oh, accounts from people who have had Shakti sessions. And uh, here's one where he says a 65-minute session with the eight-coil Shakti on the temporal lobes with the amygdala and the hippocampal signals together produced very bright and vivid geometrical patterns and electrifying visions. Another mm -hmm. one said that they felt an, a sensation of expansion and peacefulness in their heart only seconds after putting the hippocampal signal on. 
They said it felt like they were taking a contraction out of their brain. Another one said, um, I was inspired to use Shakti and use the hippocampal signal with Fibonacci amplitude cycle. That means it gets louder and quieter over the right mm -hmm. side of the brain. This session made a real impact on me, not only in my brain, but also physically. What I am most delighted about is the fact that my whole body feels lighter. Here's another one. Someone had a vision where they saw they were flying towards a forest, which they would dive into. And as they did so, the trees became this fractal field of forms that began to revolve and undulate. They would slow to a stop and be surrounded by these fractal forms as though inside some surreal hanging garden. They would begin to revolve and spin away from me, changing to a sombrero shape with undulating tentacles, and then assumed a fractal repeating pattern and became whatever the next picture would be. They said that hmm. series repeated several times. These are some of the ones that I heard with Person Gurr's material. Um, he said that Jesus has been cited, um, Virgin Mary, Mohammed, monks in hooded robes, knights in shining armor, and a Native American deity, the Sky Spirit. And that there had been out of body experiences and uh, a kind of near death and near death experiences relived. Uh, it would be more appropriate to say to first of all say that it's not about near-death experiences so much as the different phases in near-death experiences. Commonly the first phase is an out-of-body experience. The second is going yes. through a tunnel or a void. The third yes. is the experience of being bathed in the light. The fourth yes. is meeting the being of light, usually understood to be God. The fifth is the life review, where you review or relive or re-experience your entire life in a, a mm -hmm. very short period of time. Uh, the sixth after that is a transcendent experience, which is actually pretty rare and can involve things like having all the mysteries of the universe revealed, traveling through a library where all they had to do was think of something and immediately the information would become available so that all secrets, right. all knowledge, all insights and intimations about how the cosmos and how human beings work would be revealed to them. So these are each phases of near-death experience. He's had out-of-body experiences. He's had people be in the void. That's actually a little more common with Persinger than the tunnel, although in near-death experiences it's the other way around. The tunnel's mm -hmm. more common than the void. He has elicited visions of the light. Uh, that's mm -hmm. specifically through stimulation of the amygdala on the left side. He has gotten people to experience not reliving their lives, but the involuntary recall of events in lives, so that uh, I have a report from a Shakti participant who spoke about suddenly they began to be sort of hit with lots of early childhood memories, in one case including memories of smells. Mm -hmm. um, and this is phenomenologically very similar to the life review. He has right. had visions of God uh, of about 2,000 people who had experienced that particular uh, session design. Twenty mm -hmm. or so had experienced visions of God. And, mm -hmm. of course, the number is probably quite higher because a lot of people just don't want to get out of a laboratory and go stand in front of a group of graduate students and a senior professor and say, well, I saw God. Yes, and that's the sort of I thing know. that gets you ridiculed. So the number know, is probably yeah. higher. But mm -hmm. even if the number is ten times higher than, than the, uh, the validated reports, we're still dealing with less than 10% of everybody. So seeing sure. God in the lab is... Uh, is quite rare. It got the nickname of the God Helmet for the Karen Helmet, but I think it would be just as appropriate to say the Anti-Depression Helmet because it's also <laughs> been tested in clinical trials for the treatment of clinical depression as it happens following traumatic brain injury because Dr. Persinger is a specialist in treating brain injuries. So yeah. we don't get complete near-death experiences. Rather, we get fragments or features of near-death experiences that occur yes. during the session. And there is one exception to that and one exception only that I'm yes. aware of. And that happened in 1998 while I was working with some uh, students who were at a massage school in Northern California, the mm -hmm. Harbin School of Shiatsu and Massage. One of their students volunteered to receive one of these sessions. And we did a two-phase se session, not the same design as Dr. Persinger's, but still a two-phase session. During the first phase, he got some interesting body sensations and a sense of relaxation and nothing special. During the second mm -hmm. phase, he had a full episodic vision, just like a near-death experience is an episodic vision. He, mm -hmm. During his vision, he met spirit guides, he moved from place to place, he had conversations, and it was very powerful. Now, what distinguished mm -hmm. this person 
from the other subjects, mm -hmm. he had had a near-death experience. Right. And his brain okay. was and already primed and exercised to have that type of experience. And yes. This is important I mean, I'm, in understanding. Yes. This is important in understanding how Dr. Persinger's uh, procedures make different results for different people. The experience yes. most they're most likely to get is something they've had before. So that if someone has been out of their body, perhaps spontaneously or due to LSD or something like that, they're a better candidate for an out-of-body experience through this procedure than someone who has not. Although there have been people who've never been out of their body who had their first out-of-body experience using this technology. Now, who is a candidate then for uh, alien abduction type um, experiences? I would say it's a matter of their personal background. There was a researcher, um, Kenneth Ring, I believe, mm -hmm. and he did a study of people who'd had alien abduction experiences, and he already had done some studies of people who'd had near-death experiences and were able to recall them, because only about a third of the people who go clinically flatline, who are clinically dead, and then are resuscitated, report near-death yes. experiences. So he wanted to yes. find out what the difference was. And what he found out was that the people who reported alien abduction experiences and the people who reported, re I'm sorry, recalled near-death experiences had a history of childhood abuse. Really? And my interpretation of this result is that those people as, a, as children had been put into traumatic situations and learn to dissociate from it, disconnect from it. And they mm -hmm. would go inside and find, if you like, an inner space in which they could hide from the abuse. And yeah. later on in life, if they had dramatic events that happened in their consciousness, they were more likely to recall them. They had had yeah. experience disconnecting and going into another world. And that experience served them in good stead when they had near-death experiences. It enabled them to, uh, to recall the experience. Yes. Um, Near, but in uh, alien abduction experiences are almost always hellish. There are very few of them that are pleasant. The alien abduction scenario did not enter our culture until about 25 years ago. Yes. And yes. previous to that, I'm not sure what the primary content of these experiences was, but there was a time when altered state experiences in Western culture, altered state experiences of this magnitude, were most commonly uh, experienced as visions of hell, visions of the devil, and in yeah. some cases, visions of heaven. Dante, who wrote the Divine Comedy sure. with the book of the Paradise and the book of hell, he is said to have had visions of exactly this type. There's a very famous book in Southeast Asia called the Book of Prat Malai. Now, Prat Malai is a Buddhist monk who had visions of heaven and hell, and he came back and wrote about his experience. The, book, the culture preserved his book. It's now You can go into any religious supply bookstore in Bangkok and just buy a copy. And mm -hmm. when I gathered near-death experiences in Thailand, I found that something like 80% of them corresponded to the model of the book of Pramalai, complete with visions of hell and the different tortures for different sins, lords of the underworld coming uh, like grim reapers to, to tell you that you're dead and take you to the underworld. So what I think is happening is that the culture gives people a certain expectation about what death will be like. And to a large yeah. extent, our deaths, our death process, our near-death experiences, if we have them, tend to correspond to our expectations, though never exactly. And those expectations are usually drawn from religious sources, but never completely. Yes. So I think what's yes. happening with the alien abduction scenario is that people are having these kinds of experiences, and because they've read about them and they have some knowledge of it, and people have heard about the unpleasant bits, the anal probes, being taken away against your will, being held on an examination table, and they get the motifs through references in television programs, uh, wherever yeah. you like. There's even a couple of movies about alien abduction experiences. So this yep. tends to prime the experience and helps people to expect that they're going to be negative, and that makes it much more possible that they will be negative. Set and setting is very important yeah. in altered state experiences, and our cultures provide a gargantuan, a gigantic set and setting for the unfolding of altered state experiences. It's as though the experiences were a template that can be filled in with any color. 
And the colors yeah. we use to fill in the spaces on the template are given us by the culture, but the template itself comes from our brains. When you say set and setting, what do you mean? A set and setting refer is an actually an old 1960s phrase. I believe Timothy Leary is one of the people who really uh, put it in the cultural mind. And what was happening at that time was that they were actually taking people and bringing them into temple-like environments and giving them LSD, literally just to see what would happen. And yes. they found that if the set and the setting were well done, so that the setting would have low light, candles, gentle music, then people yes. spoke in subdued tones of voice and they kept their comments on the positive, it would really help people to have positive experiences. If, mm -hmm. on the other hand, the set and setting was broken by some idiot at the door banging loudly, demanding to be given some LSD, and uh, freaking out from an LSD trip coming and looking for help, this would tend to break the setting and help a person to have a negative experience. So yep. our culture, the environment we live in, the words people use, what we see on the television, provides an enormous context for the unfolding of altered state experiences. Okay. Um, how did um, Dr. Persinger get the idea of first doing this with a helmet? Well, it began with a device called the Relaxit, R-E-L-A-X-Z-I-T. And this was a relaxation device that used very simple magnetic fields that turned on and off and located them over your frontal lobes. So mm -hmm. he got some basic, ordinary relaxation responses from this, but he also went a little bit further. And he did a study where people were uh, given a narrative. They were, someone would read them a story while they were getting this device, this device's session. And they found that the people who heard the story under the influence of the device recalled a lot less of the story than those who just heard the story. So he decided that it was very likely that this device was perturbing memory consolidation. So what he did was he built his own device, the, the, the forerunner of the Koren helmet, and put it over people's temporal lobes and found that this perturbed their memory recall, their ability to consolidate memories even further. Well, he already knew that the temporal lobes were a very good candidate. They were heavily implicated in the explanation of religious and mystic experiences, uh, psychic perceptions, paranormal stuff. So he decided to take the research in that direction. And he found after a number of trials and different efforts that uh, it was possible to induce these experiences with people. So after that, it became a matter of refining the procedure. He uh, knew that the amygdala was one of the most sensitive. It is the most sensitive structure in the brain. It uses more blood than any other part of the brain. Uh, there's a very famous epileptologist named Glore who had published a book on the amygdala and reported that it was really probably the single most likely locus, beginning point for epileptic seizures. So he got um, an amygdaloid signal. It's one that occurs in everybody, but he actually found it in the EEG of, a, of an epileptic. Uh, Is it, was the epilepsy interest preceding or after this interest in this relaxed and all of that? It was uh, parallel. They both went on at the same time. So he found, sorry, I interrupted, the epileptic, uh, you were saying he found an epileptic signal no. in the amygdala of no. an epileptic? No, he found an amygdaloid signal in an epileptic, one that also occurs in normals. And the reason I'm being so very uh, fastidious about making this point is that there are any number of people who have misinterpreted Dr. Persinger's papers and decided that what he's doing is putting an epileptic seizure into someone's brain and, oh my God, this, this technology could cause epilepsy. Well, yeah. it can't, it doesn't, and the signal wasn't epileptic. It was amygdaloid. No. What so, does an amygdaloid signal mean, Todd? A signal that is derived from the amygdala, a signal that right. appears when the amygdala is especially active, and it appears on EEGs. Is that where EEGs, wait, EEGs come from the amygdala? EEGs when, when they're come tracking from all an over e the brain. Right, okay, so not just amygdala. That's right. It stands right. for electroencephalography, and it refers to uh, the technology that leaves patients uh, with their heads covered with little electrodes that yes. attach to a computer that drives a group of pens, and the pens actually trace out their brain waves. This is just trying to, 
to understand the extremes of the experiences. Have people ever run out of the room, and has it ever been that fearful? Um, not in my experience, but I think Dr. Persinger had that happen once or twice. I think one vol- I read about one volunteer just ran, <laughs> fled from the room. But I mean, as you say, at over 2,000 people. It's it's fairly uh, it's fairly innocuous. Yes, um, if two th- if 20 people out of 2,000 can see God, one yeah. out of 2,000 seeing the devil is pretty darn good. And yeah, of course, um, it's important it, to understand that there have been new session designs based on these uh, principles that allow us to avoid that negative first phase. I am the inventor of Shakti. Uh, I developed the software, and the exact session design that produced that is not in Shakti because it has a potentially negative first phase. And as a technology that's available to the public, safety must come first. There are four or five other designs that allow the same principles to be recruited in slightly different ways for similar effects. So we, the Tell lessons are not lost, even though I don't use exactly the same session design. I don't want anyone to go into a state of terror, even if it is followed by God. <laughs> Tell me why they explain again. Why did you have to go into the negative first with the first with the first product with the first Koran helmet? Uh, well, the Koran helmet isn't and never has been a, a product. But yes, a, of course. A good way to explain it is that if you start off stimulating the negative side of the brain for that structure, that stimulation builds up slowly, and then you suddenly move it over to the positive side of the brain for that structure, then Mm -hmm. that activation is very sudden and very dramatic, so that it can actually be far more powerful on, on the positive side than the other one was on the negative side. Now, if you look at really dramatic, flamboyant religious visions and religious transformations from the past, from tradition, you find that there is that theme. Jesus spent 40 days and 40 nights in the desert, and towards the end of it he met Satan in himself in the flesh, who tempted him to turn stone into bread, to throw himself off a cliff, uh, all sorts of things. And yes. Jesus told him, "Thou man does not live by bread alone. And then finally said, get thee behind me, Satan. But yes. meeting Satan cannot be a nice experience. And as far as I'm aware, that is the last episode recorded from Jesus' time in the desert. Uh, Presumably afterwards, some kind of experience came to him that allowed him to leave the desert, go into Jerusalem, and begin his teaching work. The Buddha became enlightened one morning, so they say March 21st. Uh, But the night before, he uh, had been visited by the the armies of Mara, the lord of evil, along with his daughters, who who had such names as anger, greed, desire, lust, and so forth. And they did their best to tempt him away from the efforts of his meditation. Uh, He stood them all down. The legend has it that he touched the earth and called the earth herself to witness that he was going to attain final enlightenment in uh, in that lifetime. And apparently, Mm -hmm. according to the legends, the Earth Mother appeared with wet hair, wrung her hair out, and produced a flood so vast that the demons of Mara were swept away. Mm -hmm. Ramakrishna, before his enlightenment, had a period during which he uh, felt that he was going to die. And he had this prediction, I believe it was from a psychic or perhaps from his own insight. I'd have to read the story again. But he knew he was going to die on a certain date. So he lay down and invited death to come and take him. He deliberately willed himself into the fear of death and tried to will himself beyond it. And in the course of that experience, something happened. No, the following day he was out walking and he saw the sky was cloudy and some birds flew by and they were utterly black against the muted light of the overcast sky. And the contrast was so striking to him that something happened. He fell down, and when he woke up, he was the saint Ramakrishna. Bhagwan Sri sure. Rajneesh, a very controversial guru. Uh, a lot of people have bad things to say about his methods, but no spiritual teachers that I know of have read his book and announced that he was a fake. Uh, mm-hmm. He had an experience after years of meditation where he felt that he was sort of unraveling from the inside, that he was uh, losing himself somehow, and it was a very painful process. And then one night, he got up, lying on his uh, his poor little cot in this run-down wooden shack, 
and was compelled to leave the room, to get out, to get under the sky, to be in a large space. And he walked around for a little while and found himself coming to a park that was um, actually locked up and he had to climb over the wall. The whole air around him was suffused with light. And then he saw one particular tree, a Malshri tree, mm-hmm. that was just glowing. And he felt to walk to it, sit down under it, and just wait. And this horrible inner malaise which had been on him for so long disappeared and then something happened and he attained mm-hmm. what he called his enlightenment. So I do understand what you're talking about. It's a negative experience and coming into a positive experience. That's right. And the just, same principles just, are recruited in Dr. Persinger's uh, best known session designs. Do you feel that all psi experiences are happening in the amygdala? Not in the amygdala specifically, but I believe that they all have a neural component with one or two significant exceptions. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, out-of-body experiences have been elicited by stimulation of two parts of the brain on the surface. One of them is the uh, angular gyrus, and that was a result published quite recently, 2002. And the other was the sylvian fissure, which was done in the 1950s by the neurosurgeon Wilder Penfield. Uh, Mm -hmm. In addition, there have been people who use Shakti uh, and have had out-of-body experiences. They were not stimulating the surface of their brain so much as the deeper structures, in particular the hippocampus, which is a very cognitive structure. So I'm Mm -hmm. prepared to believe that out-of-body experiences involve specific patterns of neural activity, probably involving all three of the brain parts I just mentioned. But at the same time, there have also been reports from people who've had out-of-body experiences in conjunction with near-death experiences where they had perceptions while they were out of their body that they could not have had while they were in their body. Most commonly, these are reports of resuscitation procedures. Six-year-old kids are able to describe defibrillators, and there's no way they would know anything about it. But the really telling ones are a couple that happened to adults who left their body and in this experience left the emergency room or the uh, intensive care unit and actually started floating up above the hospital. And in one case, a woman saw a red tennis shoe on the roof of the hospital. When she revived, she was in her 90s and had had a heart attack. When she revived, she wanted to know if her experience was real because to her it meant if I really went out of my body, then there is life after death. And if I didn't go out of my body, if it was just an illusion then my life may well stop when my body stops. So she was completely excited, far too excited for any coronary patient, but she begged, would someone please go up to the roof and see if there was a red tennis shoe there? Now, this was at uh, a a hospital in Hartford, Connecticut, and there was a near-death researcher who was working there. So the buzz got around pretty quickly, and he said he dropped what he was doing and came, and went with a janitor and a nurse and went to the roof of the hospital and brought her the red tennis shoe that meant that life would go on after the <laughs> demise of her body. And she, the yes. woman was just overwhelmed. I yes, heard this story I from can. a speaker. This red tennis shoe, this beat-up, war, weather-worn piece of trash meant life goes on. And I just love I the symbolism of that. What about things like um, intuition, precognitive stuff, Um, telepathy. I know the remote remote viewing you found. Was he also sending it to the amygdala, the uh, uh, stimulation to mess up um, Ingo Swan's brain? Well, he didn't mess up Ingo Swan's brain. What he did was Ingo Swan was the remote viewer, and Ingo Swan was in the chair in the chamber. And outside the chamber, another person was looking at a series of pictures and mm-hmm. Ingo Swan was able to tell which, which picture was open and exposed to view. They put an array of magnetic coils around the edge of the room so that the fields between the coils would cover the space where someone was doing the viewing, looking at the pictures that the remote viewer was supposed to see. Of course, they both had to be looking at them at the same time, if only to know... So the fields were covering the picture. The fields were going over the picture. Is that right? No. Imagine uh, a doorway, and there are magnetic coils around the edge of the doorway. So the doorway is filled with magnetic field. Now expand that to cover an entire wall, and you have the arrangement. And then they ran a signal which actually cycled from a low frequency to a medium frequency and back to a low frequency. 
while that was running, while there were these magnetic fields between Ingo Swan and the pictures he was remote viewing, then he was not able to get uh, the result. If that's the case, what does that say about geomagnetic influence outside of a, a helmet? Let's say if Ingo had a lot of geomagnetic stress going on between him and a site, say it was a very noisy day geomagnetically, would that mess up his ability to remote view? Well, Ingo Swan is a very exceptional remote viewer. So sure, I don't of course. know that it would interfere with his perception. But I do know, summarizing all of Dr. Persinger's research in this area, that on days of geomagnetic storm, psychic skills are lowered. And on days of geomagnetic quiet, psychic skills are enhanced. I presume that that also means that Persinger, this is why I feel, knowing that li literature, that he's misunderstood, that, that people believe that he believes that all stuff is just stimulating. You know, all of these kinds of experiences are just a result of, of brain stimulation. Well, you're, and, always brain, you're always brain stimulating a specific person, and that person always has a unique neural history, as unique as any snowflake or fingerprint. Yes. But what I'm saying is that he's saying that all these experiences, the, the critics are saying that he's saying all the experiences only originate in the brain, you know, i.e. that you're tickling the brain with these magnetic fields and you, you have visions, etc., or psychic experiences. Whereas what I gather is that he's saying the stimulation of the brain is not the psychic experience or that the, the entire cause of it, but it may be a modulating factor. Yes, except for those, uh, those studies I mentioned before where it starts off gradually stimulating one side and then it suddenly moved to the other side, targeting a specific structure. In those cases, the experience might entirely be a, a result of brain stimulation because that's a very powerful session design. Uh, in fact, yes. it's designed to elicit these kinds of experiences. There is such a thing as psychic phenomena, telepathic powers and things like that, that that aren't just a case of, you know, of artificial brain stimulation. I would say that when people are having these experiences without the stimulation, I don't look to see whether or not the geomagnetic levels were here or there on the day that they had the experience. I always look back into the person's individual history to find the yeah. source for the experience. Not saying that that gives me a better scientific explanation. When I'm talking to these people, they don't want a scientific explanation. They want an explanation that feels meaningful to them personally. And that's what yeah. I'm looking for. But as the, year go, the years go by, I find that this is a better method of looking at it in order to gain a good perspective on the whole picture. Did Persinger ever do anything about sidereal time? Not that I'm aware of. Oh, When the planets are at a certain point in the heavens. No. Uh, the position of the planets in the heavens changes constantly. What he has looked into is the effects of melatonin levels, which follow a diurnal cycle and found that oh. these experiences are much more likely during the period of midnight to 4 a.m. when melatonin levels are at their peak. That must be why you stay up all night. <laughs> <laughs> Between midnight to 4 a.m., huh? uh, uh, that uh, experience, psychic experiences are at their peak. Psychic, and it, and it correlates with... Spiritual, uh, the whole class of paranormal altered state experiences are all more common at that time. Melatonin levels are highest. Okay, do you know if that has anything to do with psychokinesis at all? Or no. Only no, receiving I, I, information. I personally don't find uh, telekinesis to be a very exciting field. A man can move a cigarette paper by the force of his mind. That's a, uh, an amazing thing. But it doesn't transform people. I'm more interested in spirituality in the sense of spiritual growth, the accomplishment of spiritual experience, sure. the integration of those experiences into people's lives. I'm interested in how people can become new and better people. And telekinesis just hasn't felt so germane to me. Although what about healing? Is, I can only tell a personal story when it comes to healing. And again, mm -hmm. the background of the individual always has to be taken into account. Mm -hmm. In uh, the early 90s, I spent some time with a healer around Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, mm -hmm. He was very well known. His name was Carmu. And, mm -hmm. uh, in fact, if you look him up on the Internet, Carmu, Cambridge, Massachusetts, is a Google search. How do you spell his name? K-A-R-M-U. I had spent some time with him. Um, I was sick, 
and he was working on healing me. And in addition, he told me that he felt that I had the potential to be a healer and that while he was working on me, he was also going to be giving me gifts of energy intended to facilitate that. Mm -hmm. And he said that he had had a lot of success teaching other people to heal through this same method. Lots of energy, a little teaching, the ability wakes up, and then, uh, and then they're healers. Mm -hmm. So uh, he had put an awful lot of effort into doing this with me. He thought that I had a very strong potential. I didn't, I didn't see it myself, but that, that mm -hmm. was okay at the time. He was the healer. I was the patient. I, of course, I was not going to refuse. Mm -hmm. Well, in uh, 1998, I had an experience in which I had uh, finally gotten Dr. Persinger's hardware, the small version of it that I had to work with. I finally got it calibrated and set up properly, and I began to run some sessions. What happened was that I ran too many sessions in too short a period of time. As a child, I had had temporal lobe epilepsy, and the locus of my seizures was on the right side of the brain, probably in the hippocampus, probably near where it meets the amygdala. So mm -hmm. my seizures were very frightening. And what happened was that as I did these sessions, I began to go into an almost psychotic state. My mind was producing nothing but very negative thoughts. I was anxious and or depressed a great deal of the time. Uh, mm -hmm. I suffered a romantic disappointment. I liked her. She didn't like me. Oh, what a, what a tragedy. And that kind of triggered things. So mm -hmm. what happened was that I really went into this, and for about eight or ten days, I was a mm -hmm. basket case. And then wow. I began to come out of it enough to do the math, so to speak. Now, I'm no mathematician, and it wasn't <laughs> numeric math. But I said, now, wait a minute. Look what I've done. I've run these sessions. I was a very young junior neuroscientist at the time. I wasn't a member of Dr. Persinger's research group yet. And I said, well, now, wait a minute. I know that my right amygdala got slammed during the seizures. I've been applying these signals to both sides of my head. Obviously, the amygdala on the right, the fearful one, is responding more than the other amygdala. So I'm getting mm -hmm. nothing but unpleasant experiences. What should I do about this? I said to myself, okay, let's take the amygdaloid signal and run it over the temporal lobes on the left and leave the right side out of it completely. Well, I did that. And immediately, I had, for the third or fourth time in my life, a tremendously dramatic spiritual awakening, a spiritual shift, call it what you will. But suddenly, I was in a state of bliss. I was ecstatic about everything. Everybody, old, young, male, and male or female, looked absolutely beautiful to me. Um, I remember it being a rainy day and seeing the rain come down. It was just after sunset. The rain was coming down. It was backlit by the street lights, and they made little shining diamonds that fell. I walked into the grocery store because suddenly I had appetite again. And the first person I met was a woman that I knew uh, on her way out, and she wasn't a close friend. We'd had talks a few times. I admired her for her work as a, as a spiritual healer, as it happened. And she admired my work in neuroscience. And meeting her was just a joy. It was like the long-lost lover stepping wow. off of the airplane after being held prisoner in Hanoi for years. Just this absolutely joyous meeting. And, of course, mm -hmm. there was nothing to say except, hello, and how are you? But I was just overwhelmed with how wonderful it was to see this person. And there was a girl in the checkout who sold me my... Uh, my corn dogs or my bagel dog or whatever the hell it was I was buying. And she was just the shiningest human on the face of the earth. And everything was wonderful. Wow. And I found that my hands were buzzing at the time. And I started doing some of the things Karn Mu had mentioned. Pretend that you're breathing through the palms of your hands and, and try and feel what comes up. Is it electrical? Is it, is it mushy? Is it tingly? Pay attention to those feelings. And I did. And there were all the sensations Karn Mu would said, had said would be there. I found a man who was in his 70s. He was a friend of mine. I went to his house, you know, in the afternoons just to get away from the office. He'd come by my office. He did a few sessions. Good sessions. Great sessions, in fact. Um, mm -hmm. And I told him, look, my hands are doing something. I had a teacher. He said he was a healer. Um, I want to be able to, uh, to test this. Do you have any aches or pains I could test this on? And he said he had a charley horse in his leg that had been there for about six weeks. And mm -hmm. if I wanted, I could go to work on that. So I did. I put my hands on it, and I was overwhelmed with this tremendous emotion that came to me. It was a little bit like depression. It was a little like joy. It was a little 
it was poignant, it was nostalgic, it was sweet, tender, and intensely personal. And there was no, there was nothing that had happened that mm -hmm. would trigger this. It was just moving this energy, working with these sensations, seemed to make it happen. Now, the amygdala is a very emotional structure. Yeah. So I worked on him for a few minutes. I began to feel the sensations in my hands becoming very intense. Uh -huh. And uh, he said, wow, what did you just do? And, of course, I answered like all healers, I don't know what I just did. I was just feeling this and something happened. And he said, wow, well, I think you're done. And he stood up. The Charlie horse was gone and never came back to bother him again. Shortly thereafter, I worked on a woman who was also a spiritual healer and, and quite an experienced one, 35 years as a spiritual healer. Uh -huh. And I worked on her elbow and something very similar happened. I just let it happen. The emotion came. I, my eyes filled with tears. Something happened. And she said, what was that? And then when it was gone, flexed her arm and it was gone and never came back. And she said that it was the single most powerful healing session she had ever experienced and wanted to know what was behind her. And I started saying, well, you know, we use complex magnetics, neural stimulation technology involving the limbic structures. And she says, I don't know what you're doing, but I want it. And she became one of my clients and eventually learned enough about the technology to, uh, to understand how it worked. Now, now there is one say. more thing to add to this, and that is sure. that Andrew Wheel, in his book on spontaneous healing, records yeah. a case of an individual who was dying of cancer and one night had a rage attack. He mm -hmm. went into, you know, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross has her four stages of dying, uh, yeah. denial, anger, bargaining, and acceptance. He went mm -hmm. into the anger phase so intensely that it literally blew everything else out of his awareness. He was a bundle of rage, absolute rage, angry at God, angry at the world, angry at his body, angry at everything that it makes no sense to be angry over, and it became so intense that he couldn't even think coherently enough to say, I don't need to be this angry. When he woke mm -hmm. up the next morning, his cancer was gone. Now, what does this have in common? Mm-hmm. They have in common stimulation of the left limbic system. Hmm. And the amygdala on the left is part of the limbic system. The hippocampus on the left, part of the limbic system. Uh, mm -hmm. It's all left hemispheric. And we've been able to get anger a few times. Uh, we've gotten anger with Shakti sessions twice, both of them involving the use of one brain part, the caudate nucleus on the left side, followed by stimulation of the amygdala on the left side. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and uh, lots of people have done this, but only two had that result. Why does that create healing? I don't know, and neither does anybody else alive. But it's a hell well, of a good. What do you think happened to you? What, what did I... happen to you that just what brain stimulation turned you into a healing machine? Well, uh, and did it you know, stay? Other, did it stay other... taught? Yes, I can still do it. I don't work well, with you it. You mean it's you've not... been permanently charged? Yes, I, it's not my vocation. I don't want to heal this person or that person or the other person who's in front of me. If someone's in front of me and they're in pain and they're, they're open to this sort of thing, I'll do what I can for them. But my vocation is to understand how these things work so that one day millions of people will be able to get its benefits. What's your view about it? What's about your what view happened? of it? I believe that there is some set of structures in the limbic, in the limbic system on the left, some left hemispheric process that can facilitate the ability to heal using what is traditionally called spiritual healing. And I don't know what part of the brain it is. What I believe happened to me was that I had activated both sides of my brain in this very foolish and freshman level attempt to make something happen using Persinger's technology. What actually happened was that I stimulated the wrong side. I stimulated the weakest chain in my neural links, which for me was the amygdala on the right because of my temporal lobe epileptic seizures as a child. When that activity came avalanching into the left amygdala, it, the cup ran over and activity was shunted over into many other surrounding areas, giving my experiences the nuances that were unique to me. And one of those areas was the one that's implicated in the ability to heal spiritually. Now, I would be much more hesitant about this if I didn't have Dr. Wheel's case history of the man who healed himself through anger. 
Very yeah. significant uh, observation on his part. Well, you know, it's interesting. It's interesting, too, the people who there seems to be something that happens on both sides, either anger or some people getting to a feeling of intense joy. Yes, also both of which are left, left hemispheric and left limbic phenomena, both of which implicate the amygdala more than other structures. But the amygdala alone cannot be it. Persinger and I and people who have my technology have worked, have stimulated the amygdala on the left lots and lots and lots of times, and that didn't come up. So it's right. a more recondite process than we're able to get right. our fingers on now. Personally, considering that five years ago, I didn't know that any of this was possible, to yes. even have these few clues on the table, is, to me, represents a great step forward. Is the amygdala responsible for the sense of I and the emotional response in relation to I? Uh, the amygdala is absolutely involved in it, but so are several other structures. In one of his papers, Dr. Persinger wrote that the most suspected pathways for the human sense of self would run temporal lobe, that's outside, on the right side, to uh -huh. amygdala on the right side, to hippocampus on the right side, to hippocampus on the left, to amygdala on the left, and to temporal lobe on the left. Or uh -huh. perhaps temporal lobe right, amygdala right, hippocampal right, amygdala left, hippo hippocampal left, and then temporal lobe left. But in either case, these seem to be the most decisive areas involved in maintaining the sense of self. The sense of self can be disturbed by any number of agents, brain injury being one of the best known. Our sense of who we are changes more easily than you'd think. In one of his papers, Dr. Persinger talked about grief response. When we experience grief, it's not necessarily the loss of the one that we love but rather the loss of part of ourselves that associate with that person. And yeah. when a person has a brain injury, they will often go into a grief response. Yeah. And the, what they're grieving for, if we can put it that way, is a grieving for a part of themselves that is now lost. And of course, it isn't a classical grief, grief response. And they're not mourning, per se. But no. nevertheless something that they knew to be of themselves is now gone and they feel yeah. different and they feel unhappy about it. Now there are going to be a few traumatic brain injury patients where the part that they lose will be a part that they don't want. So yeah. the right amygdala somehow is, is traumatized in the course of an injury and that means that yeah. it will be harder for them to feel fear. That means that they're going to feel better all the time. Well who goes to the doctor for, to stop feeling better? So there's another cohort, there's another group out there that's probably yeah. unstudied because nobody yeah. goes to the doctor f for feeling good. You only go for... No, that's for, that's for sure. So a huge yeah. amount of relevant information is missing from this field. Uh, yeah. Fortunately, in my work, focusing on spirituality and having a website as I do, I get a lot of information from people who visit the site and they send me emails. So I am beginning to build a database of this kind of yeah. information. But they are always ordinary people speaking ordinary language, and they can't tell me that it was their inferior temporal sulcus, you know. <laughs> <laughs> now, what is the parietal lobe all about in terms of anything re relating to psychic experience? The parietal lobes are the part of the brain that mediate our ability to uh, control our bodies and to receive and to be aware of sensations in our bodies. There are studies coming up all the time with new and unexpected roles for the parietal lobes. I remember hearing recently that acalculia, the inability to perform simple mathematical equations like addition and subtraction, involves a uh, compromising of an area in the inferior uh, parietal lobes on the left mm. side. So we never thought that the parietal lobes had anything to do with math, but they do. Uh, huh. Dr. Andrew Newberg did some studies of Carmelite nuns and Buddhist monks, and he found that a, sim a similar area on the left side in the parietal lobes, he found their left parietal lobes were more active in these people than in other people. But then on the other hand, another researcher found that these same areas were quieter in communities of spiritual practitioners than they were in normals. So obviously the parietal lobe has some involvement, but because one study finds they're more active and another study finds they're less active, more than likely, 
It's some other area of the brain that's involved in it. And the parietal lobe differences reflect deeper differences. I'm a little yes. bit skeptical about conclusions about the brain's role in spirituality, paranormal experiences, psychic skills, based entirely on brain imaging. I much prefer having a person's unique neural history together with an account of their experiences and then looking for the matches there. When people have these psychic experiences, usually they explain they have to get into a, quote, alpha state. Do you find that's the case? Do you find their brain needs to quiet down or speed up? For psychic perception, I would say quiet down, which uh, actually corroborates Dr. Persinger's finding that times of geomagnetic quiet are more conducive to psychic perception. Well, Todd, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. And it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you.